The Skeletal Muscle Files, Multifaceted Wonder. This is Dr. Jeetan Bendo for Physician Perspectives. I always tell my patients, friends and family, for maximum health mileage, invest in skeletal muscle strength. The returns are exponential. And that is really true in many different ways because to keep skeletal muscle strength up and running, you got to keep skeletal muscle in top condition. Mobility is our superpower and that is made possible with the help of skeletal muscle. However, skeletal muscle is a very expensive tissue. So why use an important organ, the skeletal muscle, for only one use, like mobility? Why cannot we use it for other important aspects of biology as well? So let's look into that. I call the skeletal muscle multifaceted. In this presentation, let me present a few of these facets of skeletal muscle. I will cover each of these facets in detail in some other presentations. Let's look at the first facet, skeletal muscle as an endocrine and a paracrine organ. Here's a review published in 2017, muscle as a paracrine and endocrine organ. So skeletal muscles are highly abundant and metabolically active and are known to communicate the energy demands to other organs through active secretion. As I said, they're very expensive tissue. So muscle-derived secretory proteins include a variety of cytokines and peptide collectively referred to as myokines. Very important. And these myokines exert autocrine, paracrine or endocrine effects. Autocrine means self-regulatory, paracrine uh, means uh, uh, something that affects the cells in the local environment and endocrine, cells in the or tissue or organs at a distance. Myokines is derived from the Greek words muscle and motion. Now, we know that muscle cells have the capacity to produce several hundred of these myokines. We know of at least 300 right now. Here's a glimpse into some of the myokines. IL-4, 6, 7, 15 and LIF promote muscle hypertrophy. This is autocrine. Myostatin, another myokine, inhibits muscle hypertrophy and exercise leads to the liver to secrete a myostatin inhibitor called folistatin. BDNF, that is brain-derived no neurotropic factor, and IL-6 are involved in AMPK-mediated fat oxidation. Now, IL-6 also stimulates lipolysis. IL-6 has anti-inflammatory properties. IL-6 stimulates cortisol production and a nearby neurocytosis and lymphopenia. Another important um, uh, myokine, irisin, has a role in browning of white adipose tissue. So there are several of these myokines and I will, I will talk about many of them as we go along. Skeletal muscle as a metabolic organ. The skeletal muscle is the single largest organ in the body. That is why it is important. And it is the major site of insulin stimulated glucose uptake in the postprandial, that is a post meal state. About 60 to 70 percent of your glucose is taken up by the skeletal muscle. So, the complications of diabetes on skeletal muscle mass and physiology results from either insulin deprivation or insulin resistance. Even though it is not life threatening, it accelerates the lost physiological functions of glucose homeostasis. Myostatin, a myokine I mentioned earlier, is a dominant inhibitor of muscle mass. So high myostatin, low muscle mass, low myostatin, increase in muscle mass. So a depression of myostatin enhances muscle mass effectively. Right. Now, a high level of myostatin has been found in skeletal muscle and plasma in severely obese patients. So the high level of myostatin reduces muscle mass, a reduction in muscle mass redu reduces the amount of glucose that can be taken into the muscle postprandially. That causes a metabolic challenge. So a high fat to muscle ratio was significantly associated with the prevalence of metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. Therefore, this muscle mass is seriously very important. The authors of this paper also present findings that showed that FMR, that is fat to muscle ratio, uh, that it can be a 
novel indicator for detecting the absence or presence of metabolic syndrome, particularly in metabolically healthy normal weight individuals and metabolically obese, obese weight individuals. The authors of this meta-analysis relationship between relative skeletal muscle mass and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease go on to report that skeletal muscle mass index in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases, NAFLD, was lower than healthy people. And patients with sarcopenia, that is low muscle mass and strength, have higher occurrence of NAFLD as well as its advanced stages including non-alcoholic steatohepatitis NASH or NAFLD related significant fibrosis. Now NAFLD or NASH all belong to something called as MAFLD, Metabolic Associated Fatty Liver Disease and skeletal muscle plays an important role in this condition. Skeletal muscle as an energy influencer. Here's an interesting publication published in 2016. One of the take-home messages is that muscle influences energy and protein metabolism throughout the body. So if you look at the loss of lean body mass, a loss of 10% is associated with decreased immunity and increased risk of infection. A loss of 20% decreased wound healing, increased muscle weakness and increased risk of infection. 30% difficulty in sitting down, pressure ulcers, pneumonia and inability to heal. What about 40%? So a loss of lean body mass of 40% increases the risk of death, usually from pneumonia. Skeletal muscle as an organ decreases dementia, depression and stress. So here's a paper, Physical Activity and Muscle Brain Crosstalk. And the authors talk about exercise, which has beneficial effects on brain health, contributing to decreased risk of dementia, depression and stress. And that exercise benefits the skeletal muscle. And that is important in its role in restoring and maintaining cognitive function and metabolic control. Myokines, again. Muscle releases cathepsin B and irisin, which work on the hippocampus, improves learning, memory and mood. Now, there's another interesting molecule called as KYN. KYN is a neurotoxic uh, molecule that is associated with depression. But muscle, on stimulation by exercise, of course, enhances PGC1-alpha again, which uh, increases the expression of something called as CAT. KAT, kinoneurin aminotransferase, which converts the neurotoxic KYN into neuroprotective KYNA. And this helps in reducing depression-like symptoms. What about skeletal muscle and cognitive function? Here's an interesting article published in 2022, where the authors talk about a substantial uh, availability of evidence supporting four pathophysiological mechanisms that may underlie the association between low muscle mass and cognitive impairment. They are systemic inflammation, insulin, protein metabolism, and mitochondrial function. So here's the illustration, low skeletal muscle mass that affects systemic inflammation, insulin metabolism, protein metabolism and mitochondrial function and all the challenges that follow these four major challenges which all affect cognitive function. I'll present this paper some other time in another presentation. So there you go. Some of the reasons why I call the skeletal muscle multifaceted. I understand this is very short but I will get into some of these facets in some other presentations. So thank you for listening.